Hello, this is Ed Chapman, and today we're going to look at basic cell biology and the problem of surface area. We're going to focus in this uh, video cast on these two major points here. We're going to look at the tools that biologists use to um, study cells, and we're going to look at how eukaryotes are different from prokaryotes. Probably the most familiar tool to in biology is going to be the microscope and I'm sure most of you have used or I at least hope most of you have used a light microscope which basically takes a sample something you want to look at and shines light up through the sample into a tube and then somewhere you know all sorts of other things you have your eye looking at an image of what's come, what's the light is shining through. So in order to look at something under a light microscope, the light has to pass through it. So we've got a transmission of light situation here. And depending on how much money you want to spend, uh, light microscopes can be very inexpensive up to extremely expensive, lots of different kinds. Um, another type of microscope, which you generally don't see in high schools, are electron microscopes. And electron microscopes work in a couple different ways. Uh, you can take your sample and you can bounce electrons off your sample and use a computer to generate a picture. Okay, so the information somehow or another is produced in 3D, so you get a three-dimensional picture by bouncing electrons off of your sample. This is called a scanning electron microscope, and that's how you get pictures of fly heads and um, cross sections of cells, of, um, excuse me, of um, leaves and things like that. The other type of electron microscope is called a transmission electron microscope and that works pretty much like a light microscope except that you shine a beam of electrons through your sample and then you look you somehow or another use a computer to produce an image that you look at with your eye by shining a beam of electrons. So scanning electron microscopy uses um, bouncing electrons it gives you 3D images Transmission electron microscopes use um, electrons in the same way that light microscopes use light to uh, reveal the fine structure of individual cells. The next thing we need to talk about is how do you take a cell apart to study the components or the, or the organelles or the parts of a cell. And this is called cell fractiona fractionization or cell fractionation. This is when you take a cell and you break it apart into pieces. So you might have the nucleus and the cell membrane and then the cytoplasm divided up into pieces. And generally this is done by homogenization, which is pretty much like it sounds. It's by putting everything inside of a blender, basically. You blend your cell sample or your tissue sample in a blender that's set to spin at a certain speed or you blend with different chemicals like alcohols or um, enzymes. It all depends on what you want to see and how small you want the pieces to be. So once you homogenize your sample, then you centrifuge it. And centrifugation means you basically take something like a test tube, you put your liquid cell stuff in the test tube, and then you spin it really fast, okay? And you make the heavy stuff go to the bottom and the lighter stuff go to the top. So centrifugation basically separates components within a liquid sample by density, the dense parts to the bottom, the less dense parts to the top. And then when you're all finished, you end up with a test tube with different layers of stuff in it. And you may go in and take out an individual layer. So you're only interested in what's right here. And then you may centrifuge that again. So that's called differential or repeated centrifugation. And this is how cell biologists get all the different parts of cells in um, high concentration so they can study each part, maybe figure out what it does. Here's a really nice uh, electron microscope picture. Can you figure out what kind of electron microscope made this type of picture? Well, it is made by a scanning electron microscope because it is three-dimensional. This is a cross-section of a leaf. And here you can see a vein with all the water conducting tissues here. Uh, this, is, this is the um, epidermis, the epidermal cells here on the outs on the, um, uh, I guess this would be the top of the leaf down here. And this is the bottom of the leaf here. We kind of got a sandwich effect with the upper and lower epidermis. And then you have the cells stacked up inside of here with all sorts of things going on. This looks like a little hair, but you can see there's an amazing amount of detail on something as simple as a leaf. Um, if you have a scanning electron microscope, you can really see some cool things. Here's a nice graphic showing how you do homogenization and then centrifugation. Uh, here we have a test tube that has some cells in it. 
Um, the cells are homogenized, which is a fancy way of saying they're blended. And then the blended material is let, allowed to settle. And the dense parts go to the bottom, the lighter parts go to the top, the oilier parts. The liquid part is called the supernatant. Uh, the part at the bottom is called the pellet. And you may spin this for 5 minutes, 10 minutes, uh, 24 hours, uh, really fast, really slow. It all depends on the protocol of your, um, your lab technique. And what you end up with then is the material that's dense down here in the pellet and the lighter material here in the supernatant. Then let's say you want it, you're only interested in something that's going to be in the supernatant. You can take that out, keep the pellet here, set up another test tube, centrifuge it again, and then you get a different pellet of the stuff that once was suspended over here. So as you can see, by doing several different centrifugations, you can really separate a lot of different components of these original individual cells. The next topic is going to be the two basic kinds of cells, or the two types of cell architecture um, of life on Earth. Uh, you have your prokaryotes, which are things like your bacteria. Okay, those are your prokaryotes. And then there are eukaryotes, which is everything else. This is animal cells, plant cells, fungi, protists. Okay, you probably recognize these as kingdoms. So we've got four eukaryote kingdoms and one prokaryotes kingdom. Uh, what makes, or the biggest difference between eukaryotes and prokaryotes is the presence of compartments. And probably the most famous compartment of all is the nucleus. So you guys have probably already been taught in elementary school that eukaryotes have a nucleus. That's what makes them eukaryotes. Well, yes, that's right. But a nu the nucleus is just a fancy way of um, containing DNA inside of a compartment. And that's a very important idea. Uh, that kind of takes things to a, the next level, which we're going to talk about lastly. Um, eukaryotes, of course, have evolved from prokaryote ancestors. So prokaryotes are the older, simpler form, still going strong today. Uh, most of the cells on Earth are bacterial cells. They're everywhere. And they have, some of them evolved billions of years ago into eukaryotes, which are the type of cell that builds up multicellular organisms like you and me. So why compartments? Well, if a cell has compartments, it can grow larger because when you compartmentalize, you increase surface area. We'll talk more about that in just a second. Uh, when you increase surface area, you make it easier to transport materials from one place to another by using diffusion. And also, if you have compartments, you can increase how well the cell can do metabolic processes like digesting things, building things. It increases efficiency. All the materials, all the chemicals, the correct environment, can be kept in one place, in one compartment or one bag, so that everything is closer together and therefore can work more efficiently. And let's look at a picture for this. So the basic way that cells get material into and out of themselves is by diffusion. So let's say you have stuff out here in the environment that the cell needs. So just by diffusion, this material can diffuse in. And if you give it enough time, it can diffuse all the way into the central area of the cell. The problem with diffusion is it's slow. So if the distance that the material has to diffuse is small enough, we don't have a problem. But look over here. Let's say this huge cell has to get the same materials in. Diffusion is going to work at the same rate. And as you probably can tell, it's going to take a long time for this material to diffuse all the way into the center of the cell. Now, of course, remember, these look like circles, but in the real world, these look more like basketballs. They are spheres. We're talking three-dimensional space here. So the problem is that diffusion is slow. So cells are more efficient if they're small because diffusion doesn't have to move things that far. So what happens as cells get bigger? Well, let's look at the relationship here between surface area, volume, and the ratio of volume of surface area to volume, or surface area divided by volume. So here's a cube that is one unit on a side. So if you do the math here, each side is going to be 1. And if you multiply 1 times 6, you get the total surface area of 6 for this little guy right here. Total volume, of course, is going to be 1 times 1 times 1, which is 1 unit. And the surface area to volume ratio is going to be 6 divided by 1, 
which equals six. So let's say that in order for a cell to, to feed itself and, and get gases in and get gases out, that it needs a surface area to volume ratio of at least six. Now look what happens when a cell gets five times larger. Over here, this cell is five units on a side, so that means its total surface area is gonna be 150. Its total volume is gonna be 125. So its surface area to volume, 150, divided by 125 comes out to 1.2. And look, no, look how much smaller that is than when it was just one. So you can see how if a cell compartmentalizes and increases surface area by making lots and lots of little compartments, it can keep its surface area to volume ratio at some critical minimum that it needs to be, for example, six. It's a very important facet of biology and it's why we don't have giant uh, beach ball sized cells floating around in the ocean or um, rolling around on land. They just, they just can't exist at that size because the surface area to volume ratio gets too small. All right, we're going to stop there and the next video cast will pick up talking about some of these compartments in particular.